Hello everyone and welcome to this week's live stream. My name is Matthew Murray and I'm an educator here at the Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium located in Springfield, Missouri. If you're not familiar with us, we're a 350,000 square foot facility with over 800 exhibits or 800 different species of animals within exhibits across the world. These are all stretched across one and a half miles of paved trails and uh, it's all here to help celebrate conservation and help educate people on conservation and those who have already participated in conservation in, in times past. If you're not able to celebrate and learn with us, you can learn at the comfort of your own home by downloading the app Agents of Discovery. Agents of Discovery is a really cool virtual uh, learning app or uh, virtual scavenger hunt and you can download it from your app stores or by going to www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. From there, you'll see the first box that says get the app. And you can follow the directions that follow from there. Next, you'll see a box that says print images. These images will be the triggers that you'll use within the app and the app will scan these images and bring up each question within the missions. And so we have an, a different mission each month, but we use the same images. So once you print them off once, you can reuse them each and every month. If you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see our schedule of missions and activities. You'll see the theme for this month, which is presidents and conservation. Underneath that, you'll see our activity guide, which will have a really cool indoor craft and outdoor activity, as well as uh, some things to think about or to do in your own community. And finally, underneath that category, you'll see our reward for this month or our Snapchat filter. You can get this once you've completed playing the mission. So if you have any questions about that, um, just feel free to post them in the comment section below. And so if you look behind me, you'll see that I'm standing in our Grand Canyon uh, galleries located in our wildlife galleries. The Grand Canyon gallery is, is part of the National Park Service galleries that we have. And the National Park Service has many different uh, categories of, of uh, parks and uh, national parks, scenic riverways and trails, military parks and battlefields, and national memorials underneath its jurisdiction. And speaking of national memorials, we've partnered today with Mount Rushmore and the Mount Rushmore Society. And today we have with us Debbie and Stephanie of the Mount Rushmore Society. Debbie is the Chief Operating Officer of the Mount Rushmore Society, and Stephanie is the Director of Philanthropy, and they're going to help us to continue talking about presidents and conservation. How are you doing today? Hi, everybody. Doing well. Good. Glad to hear it. What do you have to talk to us about today? Well... Um, as it was said, my name is Debbie Spees, and I'm with the Mount Rushmore Society. And again, this is Stephanie Perizé. And we love everything Mount Rushmore. And if you have never visited Mount Rushmore before, you may know what it is, but you may not know exactly where it is located. Well, Mount Rushmore National Memorial is located in the central Black Hills of southwestern South Dakota. Yes, it is very cold today. It encompasses over 1,200 acres. And so it includes so much more than the actual carving that 3 million visitors come to see every year. And Stephanie is going to give us a little insight of what all those acres include. Um, the Mount Rushmore Society, we are a nonprofit organization that raises money for the National Park Service um, to help in the preservation, the promotion, and the enhancement of visitor services at Mount Rushmore. And a couple things that we do, significant contributions, is we fund the Junior Ranger program. Here are some Junior Rangers shown right here um, for over 27,000 kids a year. We also fund the salaries for the seasonal interpretive rangers and interns who give the educational programs at the park. So um, when you do come to Mount Rushmore, the next time that you're here, um, if you were to sit in on one of those ranger talks, what you would learn is that sculptor Gutzon Borglum, along with four 
800 workers. They helped carve Mount Rushmore um, from 1927 to 1941. And the reasons why these presidents were chosen um, was George Washington was chosen because he represents the birth of our nation. Thomas Jefferson represents the expansion of our nation with the Louisiana Purchase. Theodore Roosevelt represents the development of our nation because he kickstarted the construction of the Panama Canal. And then Abraham Lincoln represents the preservation of our country as he kind of kept us together during the Civil War. Now, while those are the themes, the main themes you will hear when you come to Mount Rushmore and attend one of those ranger talks, each of them made a contribution to conservation um, in different ways. And so I'll start with George Washington. So George Washington, George Washington, sorry, um, obviously was the first president of the United States. He was the commander in chief of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War, but he was also known as the father of agriculture. And this is because for a variety of reasons. One, he was primarily a tobacco farmer, but he liked to experiment with different crops, which was a little different than the people of his day. And he wanted to plant what was the best for the soil. Um, secondly, he also experimented with composting, something that wasn't done um, during that time very much. And he experimented with a seven year crop rotation. So with all of these things, he would write essays and do speeches and try to encourage the American farmer to do what was best for the soil and not to wear it out. So secondly, moving on to Thomas Jefferson, I mentioned that Thomas Jefferson uh, was um, one of the ones chosen for Mount Rushmore due to the Louisiana Purchase. Well, this is also his contribution to conservation because the Louisiana Purchase would eventually form 15 new states and also incorporate incorporated our crown jewel national parks such as Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park and Rocky Mountain National Park. He also commissioned the Lewis and Clark expedition and Lewis and Clark then were able to catalog all the variety of flora and fauna and animals that um, Americans had never heard of before. And so this really triggered um, the American fascination with wilderness and that's his contribution. Now moving on to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, um, he is of course known as one of our greatest presidents, but one of of the things you may not realize is in 1864, um, he set aside the Mariposa Grove and Yosemite Valley um, for uh, public use and resort and recreation. And this was something that really wasn't done at the time. And so he set in motion the precedent of setting aside public lands um, for recreation and for protection. Um, lastly, we have Theodore Roosevelt. Now, President Theodore Roosevelt, you learned an awful lot about him last week with Boone and Crockett's pre presentation. So this week, we thought we'd do something a little different so that you could hear from President Theodore Roosevelt himself. Ladies and gentlemen, the 16th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Hello, friends. A retired president doesn't get to be in the limelight much once he is out of the public eye. So I'm grateful when someone or some one group seeks my thoughts and opinions on a, any topic. I have been asked to speak briefly on the conservation movement and where I fit into it. I appreciate the thought that I have made an important contribution in the field of conservation and preservation as well as in the area of national parks, national forests, national monuments, wildlife refuges, and the like. Well, I have made important contributions, but not alone. 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans help move us forward in progressive thinking about our natural world. The problem had been that there had been no national thought or consciousness for conservation in any general aspect and in any respect for the wonderful country that God expects us to be good stewards of. And there was no real leadership in this area when I was younger. To illustrate where we were, I have to state that many people consider me the father of the national park system. But this is wrong. In January of 1872, a bill for the creation of the world's first national park, Yellowstone, was introduced into the Senate by Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas. It passed almost unanimously in the Senate. In February of that year, it passed in the House by two-thirds vote. This is one of those rare times where both houses of Congress have actually done something that really benefits the people of the United States, I think. On March 1st, 1872, President Grant signed the bill that created our first national park. I was still only 13 years old then. By the time I became president, there were four more national parks, Yosemite, Sequoia, Mount Rainier, and U.S. Grant. I just kind of helped promote the parks that we had. And before I left office, I got five more parks created. The national park system was helped immensely by having leaders like Stephen Mather and Horace Albright in top positions when the Park Service was created back in 1914. But by then, I had spent a lifetime interested in preserving and maintaining the natural environment. It started when I was a young lad in New York City, enthralled by the wildlife around me. Yes, even in that metropolis. My love of birds and the environment that they lived in just naturally led to interest in other animals, big animals, and other locations. And the beauty of the natural world, whether it oh, be the well-tended forests and farms of the Midwest, or the badlands of the Dakotas, well, that should swell the pride Americans have, fill the soul of every American who loves his country. As I was growing to manhood and growing my family, I could easily see that God had created a bounty of natural wealth for us, for, for we Americans. I could also see that many of my fellow citizens were missing and despoiling this land. I could see that the land in places was being ravaged. I could see the natural resources being used without thought to the future. Indeed, I was becoming alarmed that if we didn't stop our unwise use, that our future generations would suffer grievously for our greed. This is a magnificent country, the most blessed on earth. We are not building this country for just one generation. We are building it for our children and our children's children and all of the Americans to come. As a young man, I could see then that there were places in this country where our citizens were turning this natural world into a, a garbage heap. Rivers were polluted, forests were cut down, land worn out by overuse and wildlife disappearing because of lost habitat. I was determined to do something to correct this slide before it was fatal to our nation. Now, I guess I became one of the standard bearers uh, that other like-minded people could rally around. I was a charter member and first president of the Boone and Crockett Club. In January of 1888, George Bird Grinnell, editor of the Forest and Stream magazine, and I brought together in New York a group of sportsmen to form probably what would be the first group that had any clout with congressmen over issues of conservation. We established a committee that was instrumental in creating the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And we were 
1894, uh, the driving force for getting the Park Protection Act passed. This act saved Yellowstone from an ecological disaster. The club also helped establish zoological gardens in New York State. We protected sequoia groves in California, and we helped create an Alaska Island reserve for seals and salmon and birds, seabirds. These were among the early steps that led to greater awareness by our citizens and the growing realization it was up to us to do something positive in this area of national life. And it fell to me to be instrumental in leading the way in conservation in this country. I like Americans. I think that if they aren't hardcore Democrats or party bosses, that they like me. I love America, and I liked being with Americans who felt the same way. I did not mind holding the standard aloft for others to rally around, and if needed, I would do it again. I wholeheartedly believe in the wise use of our natural resources. I believe in using timberlands to provide the wood for our homes and for our industry. I believe in dams put in the proper spots to provide hydroelectric power. I believe in big farms and big ranches to provide the food for our growing population. But I believe in the wise use of our resources. Where one tree has been cut for its wood, let two be planted in its place. Where farms harvest bountiful crops, let the land lie fallow to replenish itself. Where cattle roam, be careful not to overgraze. Where rivers are dammed, let the water levels be kept even and the waters themselves be kept clean. It is not for us to use wastefully in recreation or in an effort to make a penny's profit or just thoughtlessly misuse that we have such blessings from the Almighty. Let us by our stewardship deserve what we have been given as a nation. Our conservation efforts should be for the benefit of the people. Not everything we enjoy in the country should be looked at as having value only if it has a cash benefit. Well, it looks like Teddy had to step out there. So I will continue on. We're glad that he was able to um, visit with us just for just a little bit. As Debbie said, um, I am Stephanie. Um, I am with the Mount Rushmore Society. And we've talked a lot about the presidents in conservation, the presidents at Mount Rushmore in conservation. But what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit today is about some of the current work that happens at Mount Rushmore um, with the scientists that are there every day um, conserving the natural resources in the 1200 acres at Mount Rushmore. So when most people think of Mount Rushmore, they think of the four famous faces of the sculpture. But if you take a minute and look below the four famous faces, there are some little known wonders hiding right below there. As Debbie mentioned, Mount Rushmore National Memorial is in the middle of the Black Hills National Forest. And the Black Hills National Forest is called the Black Hills National Forest because it is made up of ponderosa pine trees. And these ponderosa pine trees, if you're out in the prairie, look like a sea of black. 
Um, and so those Black Hills are the reason that it's called the Black Hills National Forest. Um, and so in the Black Hills National Forest, Mount Rushmore National Memorial has one of the second largest, oldest um, areas, areas of old growth, um, Ponderosa Pine Forest. And you may think, well, why does that matter? Um, there are a number of species that can only live in old growth forest. And 71% um, of Mount Rushmore National Memorial is actually made up of old growth Ponderosa Pine Forest. Um, to kind of put in perspective how old that forest is, um, when Christopher Columbus arrived in North America, just 27 years after he arrived, the oldest trees at Mount Rushmore were seedlings. Or put another way, in 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, the largest trees at Mount Rushmore, or the average tree at Mount Rushmore, was 13 years old. So there are a lot of really old trees at Mount Rushmore. Um, so also, I told you that it's important for a number of, of species, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of those species that rely on that old growth um, pine trees that are there. Um, if our slides were working, I'd be able to show you some pictures, so I'd just ask you to use your imagination with me, um, and we will um, we'll just kind of think through it together. So. In the crags, and I had to ask the scientists what a crag is, but those are those kind of broken down trees that you see sometimes when you're walking through the forest. Those are really important for mama bats um, to have their pups. Um, baby bats are called pups. And there are 11 species of bats at Mount Rushmore National Memorial. In fact, there's one species that's a threatened species. It's called the long-eared, I'm gonna have to look at my notes here. The long-eared, the northern long-eared bat, it's a threatened species. Um, that is at Mount Rushmore, as well as the silver-haired bat, um, which is the most common one there. And there's nine other species there. Scientists work with um, monitoring stations to check them out. They see where their migration patterns are, and they check the stuff out all the time. The slope below the Mount Rushmore is also a place that they like to go a lot. Other flying things that you will see that like to go down in the forest and soar above the the faces are um, a variety of birds. So in the trees, you may see chickadees or robins, um, but soaring above, you may see some birds of prey like eagles. There are no eagles nests in Mount Rushmore, but the eagles do love to soar over the, the faces. Um, and you may also see um, turkey vultures um, or red-tailed hawks. Um, and then just this last summer, we had our first ever pair of mating peregrine falcons. And um, that was a really exciting thing for us. They had a nest and peregrine falcons tend to return back to the same place every year. Um, so we're really excited that um, we hope that they'll come back this next year and that Mount Rushmore will become their favorite place to come back and maybe more, um, more people will come. Um, in addition to that, if you are walking along one of the trails at Mount Rushmore, Blackberry Trail or the Presidential Trail, if you kind of look down around you instead of always looking up, you'll see a number of ground animals. Those might include the yellow belly marmot or the red-tailed squirrel. Um, you might see an ermine or you might see a pine martin. Um, this summer, the scientists will be studying pine martins along with scientists from Wind Cave National Park and Jewel Cave National Park. And you may wonder what a pine martin is. A pine martin's in the weasel family. So if you picture a little weasel, that's what a pine martin looks like. A yellow-bellied marmot, which is one that you see most often, is kind of like a very fat chipmunk. Um, our scientists, they will probably say that I said that wrong, but um, I'm a lay person, and so that's what I say. They're very fat chipmunks. Um, and then my favorite animal that you may see if you're at Mount Rushmore, is actually not native um, to the Black Hills at all. And that is the Rocky Mountain mountain goat. Um, it's my favorite thing, bar none, that you might see at Mount Rushmore. Um, sometimes you see them up in the sculpture. Every once in a while, if you look really closely in one of the president's eyes, you'll see a mountain goat hanging out in there. Sometimes you see them on the slope. Sometimes you even see them on the Grandview Terrace where visitors are taking pictures or down by the parking lot. Um, as with all wildlife, wildlife, you should not approach. Um, they are still wild. 
Um, but it's very cool to see them. As I said, they are not native to the Black Hills. Um, they were a gift from the Canadian government to Custer State Park. There were six goats that were gifted to Custer State Park. They got out and um, they procreated and now we have them all over the Black Hills. And then there are a couple other animals that you probably won't see when you visit, um, but they may see you. Um, and our um, wildlife game cameras that the Mount Rushmore Society helps to fund are placed all over the park um, so that scientists can study the different migration habits and what's coming and what's going. And some of the things that they have seen include mountain lions and coyotes. Um, so it's kind of, you know, when you're walking around, you won't see them, but they may see you. So this is just a couple of the animals and birds and bats and things that you may see as well as the the massive pine trees that you would see whenever you're at Mount Rushmore. So we hope that you'll come and visit us um, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And that in addition to seeing the wonderful sculpture and learning about the themes of freedom and democracy and unity, that you'll also take a minute to look around you and see the wonderful natural resources that Mount Rushmore has to offer. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Debbie. We thank uh, the Mount Rushmore Society for, for this presentation and for, for all that you do for uh, Mount Rushmore and, and the surrounding area. Uh, there's some, some really cool facts and we appreciate Teddy Roosevelt coming in there, uh, coming out of retirement. And uh, we thank you all for joining us. And uh, if you join us for next week, we'll be uh, having another live stream as we continue our Presidents in Conservation. So before we leave, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It's a little bit long, so hang with me, but uh, I think it really encompasses a lot of what he was talking about during his, his uh, presentation there. So this is how it goes. To waste, to destroy our natural resources, to scan and exhaust the land instead of using it as to increase its usefulness will result in undermining in the days of our children the very prosperity which we ought by right to hand down to them amplified and developed. So as you can see, Teddy Roosevelt was all about setting the, the next generation up for success and not wasting their resources as we only borrow it from them. So some things to think about as we, we continue our uh, conservation theme, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.